So the, what, it, what Rob says is the bioenergetic thing that you need lots of energy to be able to repair cells and stuff like that. I guess there's something to that. But when I look around the world, the vast majority of people don't seem to be lacking in energy. They seem to be flush with energy. So I don't think that the vast majority of people are running out of energy. I think that they have an energy excess as evidenced by folks carrying around too much body fat. I'm not an insulin hypothesis camp. So what he's saying here, which is a very, very common perspective, I would say misconception, we would say misconception, which is that people who are in a state of having excess body fat have excess energy. And part of this is a nomenclature issue. Part of it is a misunderstanding or or just not really uh, a piece, like a piece of fat gain that's not really discussed uh, or just parts that are glossed over and kind of ignored uh, or just not even acknowledged to, to have any sort of, sort of existence. And so the first thing that we need to do in terms of nomenclature is separate what we mean by energy from calories and substrate. So when we're talking about energy from the bioenergetic view, or really any time we're talking about energy in terms of the human body, we should be talking in terms of ATP and other things that allow for work to be done. That's literally what energy is. You can make the argument that there's more to it than just ATP. We've kind of talked about that in the first episode in our podcast with the structuring of water and other things that have that adsorbing effect on the cellular protein structure that allows for the structuring of water. And that allows for that is the actual energy, but we can just simplify it to ATP levels. ATP equals energy. And the there's a misconception that when somebody is gaining weight, what's happening is they have converted all their fuel to energy and they have two ATP. So it's so food comes in that it, that is digested. It becomes fuel in terms of carbohydrates, fats, protein. There's so much converted to ATP to energy that now our bodies don't need any more ATP. And so they start storing the excess as fat. And that's not actually what happens. Instead, what typically happens is that the there's an inhibition, there's a problem in converting that fuel to energy. This is talked about all the time, including in the low-carb space in terms of mitochondrial dysfunction. That's what we're referring to, metabolic dysfunction, is not being able to produce energy from the fuel that's coming in. And so what that does, this is what happens to people who are overweight, who have diabetes, who have fatty liver disease. They're in this sort of state, and they're not ending up with excess ATP or even adequate ATP. What's happening is the fuel is not being efficiently converted toward energy. So there are buildups of the fuel and then it gets stored as fat. So you end up in a state where you have excess fat storage, excess of body fat and low energy. And this is bad on all levels because it means that you have less energy available to function. You have to turn down your thyroid activity, turn down the reproductive hormones, all of that. It also means that you're perpetually hungry because the main thing that's going to determine whether you're actually responding to your hunger, hunger signals, or I mean, I guess you could say the main hunger signal is energy availability. So you're going to remain hungry in that state. And that's why overeating occurs, essentially. It's kind of the main driver. And you're going to be gaining body fat, storing body fat at the same time. And so I have a graph here, a graphic that depicts this in a very kind of clearly, un, like simple way, clear to understand. And it's from a, a study titled, Decreased Energy Levels Can Cause and Sustain Obesity. It's a great study discussing Basically, this situation where obesity and being overweight is a situation where the food that we're taking in is not effectively converted to energy, and that's why it's being stored as fat. That's why you have excess hunger in this situation, and that's why you have so many other issues, and you have low energy, right? The people who are obese are not bouncing off the walls. They aren't wanting to go for a run. They aren't you know, uh, normally very active uh, generally, and it's also because of a lack of physiological energy. But so we see it very clearly in this graphic. We have the food coming in, which is the equivalent of the fuel. And then that fuel is going to be directed toward energy. Some of it will be stored as fat. And then there's also going to be some uh, fat being liberated to be uh, used as fuel. And so we see on the left side here, this is kind of a normal state where we're not gaining or losing weight. That fuel is being converted to energy rather efficiently. Maybe some small amount will be stored as fat, but some amount will also be released as fat. And we're fine. On the other side, on the right side here, what we're seeing is a state where the conversion of fuel to energy is inhibited. And so there's much less fuel being converted toward ATP and much more getting stored as fat. This is the deranged metabolism state that not only are people in when they're gaining weight, but the vast majority of people are in. And what happens for the vast majority of people who are not gaining weight, but maybe are relying on excess exercise or low calorie diets or fasting or low carb is they're still in this state, but they're forcing the burning of that fuel to energy instead of being stored as fat using these other means, using these stress means so that they're not getting the fat storage. But you're still ending up with a relative lack of energy because the energy you are producing is being wasted for 
uh, exercise or your cold thermogenesis or whatever it is that you're using to waste uh, fuel. And we've talked about this extensively. I'll link to other episodes when we've discussed this whole process, how it relates to fat loss, how it relates to virtually every condition. But basically, this is the focus, I would say, from the bioenergetic view is improving the conversion from fuel to energy, which means that you have the energy available to properly function in terms of all of your of your organ systems, your digestion, your reproductive systems, cognitive function, all of that. And the vast majority of people who are walking around and who are in these degenerative states are in the state of low energy. And so that is why rectifying this problem helps to resolve those issues. So that's basically the, in large part, the perspective that the bioenergetic view is coming from. And of course, if that's not understood, then it's going to not make much sense to want to be doing things to increase energy and, and reducing stress. But this is really kind of a, a key part here to understand. Yeah. The, it's a conflation that's like a, ma- a major conflation that's been propagated extensively inside the like even in the literature where there's this idea that calories yeah. equal energy. And when you just go from when you just say calories equal energy without understanding the entire process that that happens from the from a calorie being converted and it's not even calories, right? Because it's really breaking down into carbs and fats and proteins. But there's. And and that's the to conf- it's it's weird too, right? Because it's like if you're gonna be in a camp where you're looking at like low carb versus high carb or something like that, to conflate calories as energy is like a huge it it's just a weird thing to do because you're you're focusing on energy uh, uh, on what substrate you're using for energy and the benefits, the pros and cons of that substrate for energy. Now there were ca- caveats made by Rob here, so I don't want to mischaracterize him, but the in terms of talking about the different substrates and he was talking about it in neural regulation and satiety but i think it's even beyond neural regulation and satiety like you're what you're really looking at here is what is the process of converting a, a fat into energy into atp and the carbs into atp and then having to do protein into atp and then deter and then trying from there you're looking at that and then now you're making a determination okay what is this on the cellular level what's this on on the overall like massive level like the systemic level of the body and then trying to determine, okay, what is optimal? Like clearly we, I mean, we're coming from a, the stress perspective, which is important here, but going specifically into the, into the obesity perspective, um, it's really important to understand that the obesity situation, especially, and I've talked about this before, if you wanted to look at like calories, calories in calories out for an obese person, the weight gain that they're having, I think you would see that it doesn't line up. Like you're not going to see that their supposed metabolic rate should be X as per the a calculator. And then their actual food intake is X. So therefore they would gain, they would be over X number of calories over their metabolic rate. So they'd be gaining fat. I think, and in my experience, that hasn't been the case. In my experience, there's been like a lowered food intake. Now the food quality isn't good. And then still having fat gain, which again, and, and the, I think that the, the idea that Rob was discussing, it was a mischaracterization of the bioenergetic state because we're not talking about just having at, tons of food. You need to just have granulated sugar all the time. It's we need to have foods and adjust our lifestyle and, and the things that we're doing to optimize the flow of or production of energy from food into ATP. So our focus is less calories eight, and calories and ATP are equal. It's What is that whole process in the center of taking this food and converting it into ATP and how do we optimize it and what are the blocks that are going on there? So for people with uh, with obesity, it's discussed in this study, the blocks are inflammatory markers, inflammatory compounds, etc. directly inhibiting, I think they're talking about aconitase, which is an enzyme inside the mitochondria that in or in the Krebs cycle specifically that involves the conversion of both glucose and fatty acids into energy. So that gets blocked and then you just have substrate. So what do you do with the substrate? You just store it. <laughs> so you that's it's you it's essentially a massive shunting process. So people in the obese state are actually have way are are in the opposite end of the spectrum of what we're shooting for from a bioenergetic perspective. So it's like comparing them is completely like two entirely separate things. Like they're not even close to the same thing that that we're talking about. And it's because of that conflationary idea. So getting into the concept of understanding you have 
substrate and then you have energy and ATP and they're not the same. The substrate can be converted to ATP, but there's multiple factors in that central process that can alter that conversion. And it's ex- that's where the that's where the magic is, is in that centerpiece, mm-hmm. that conversion process. That's what all of these hours of podcasts and arguments and debates and everything else is like. Re- that's where everyone is kind of focusing in on now. And that's where the idea of bioenergetics, which is not like a I know it's like a hashtag now, but like in research, it's discussing the flow of energy substrate to energy that is that's all that it is 